I have raised a second issue repeatedly in all of my lectures, and that is the old argument of Joseph Alois Schumpeter and many other economists, who maintain that though credit expansion can produce the effects we have all studied and have revisited today, it can also offer an advantage or produce positive effects, especially to the extent that it permits the introduction, or so they claim, of technological and entrepreneurial innovations which foster economic development. Well, as I state in the paper, this is a contemptible argument. It is the same argument employed by someone who says, listen, there is a great advantage to wars. What is it? Well, wars enhance human ingenuity. And just think what we have gained from wars. We have introduced radar, for instance, and other innovations. And in building atomic bombs to destroy each other, we have made these technological innovations, which have later been harnessed by entrepreneurs and have exerted many positive effects on the economy, and so on. In a market economy, when entrepreneurs have viable, sustainable projects, which consumers are going to somehow back or support, it is important that these entrepreneurs receive financing for their projects via healthy processes of financial intermediation, in an environment of liberty, based on legal principles. However, it is equally, if not more important, that entrepreneurs not receive financing for harebrained projects, those that they are going to be unable to culminate, or that lack the support of enough consumers to be maintained. And this is true both intratemporally and intertemporally, between the present and the more or less distant future. It is a general economic principle. The only thing we must be clear about is that we are not capable of distinguishing from the outside, from above, through a planning agency or on our own, which projects are sustainable and should be financed and which are unsustainable. Only a market process backed by entrepreneurs in a context of liberty can distinguish between these two types of projects. However, for this to occur, the essential signals of the process, particularly the social rate of time preference, which is reflected in the interest rate, must not be manipulated or covered up. Also, the process of financial intermediation, a vital characteristic of the market, must not be confused with the radically different process of money and liquidity creation. Currently, and tragically, for the reasons we have discussed, these two institutions, money creation and financial intermediation, have been combined. As a result, under the current circumstances, a process of credit expansion takes place and leads to investment errors on a massive scale. To the extent that real factors of production are materialized in capital goods produced in error, society becomes poorer. This is exactly the opposite of what Schumpeter and his acolytes assert. Far from fostering long-term economic development by permitting the introduction of new technologies which would otherwise not be introduced, credit expansion is extremely harmful because it leads to investment projects that are not profitable and hence misuse society's scarce real resources. And ultimately, in the long run, we are poorer in a process of credit expansion. Despite appearances, and despite the fact that the Spanish economy appeared to grow by 3, 4 or 5 percent year after year for 10 years. And in the end, what do we have? Some Egyptian pyramids or a magnificent high-speed train which may give us plenty of satisfaction when we ride it, but which incurs such huge losses that in terms of economic rationality, we will never be able to recover what such a monumental entrepreneurial error has cost us. Furthermore, there are many indications that this process encourages capital consumption in addition to malinvestment. To some extent, during the bubble stage, everyone is fooled by a sort of money or wealth illusion. If my neighbor sells his apartment for a million euros, when I bought mine for 300,000, I immediately put myself in his place and consider myself a millionaire, since my apartment must also be worth a million euros. And even if there is no change in the future flow of returns on the apartment, since I need to live in it, I still say, hey, I have a million euros I did not know I had. Make reservations for a Caribbean cruise. We are going on vacation, and we will pay for it in installments or with the credit card. Or I say, let's buy a new car. This is very human. I am not criticizing it. It is very human for us to all want to move up. But this illusion is accompanied by capital consumption, which also impoverishes society. So, as you can see, the malinvestment of resources means capital consumption. 
And what about the introduction of technologies that might not have been introduced based on genuine saving? Well, that may or may not be the case, but certainly in a free entrepreneurial process driven by entrepreneurship and without intervention within a legal banking framework which prevents fractional reserves, if a technology is not introduced now but is introduced in two years, then it should be introduced in two years rather than now. It would have been preferable to not have had the world wars and genocides, even if that had meant waiting 5, 10 or 15 more years for the use of radar and the GPS to become widespread. In any case, in the long run, the eventual conditions in an economic system with sustainable investment and without artificial credit expansion are much more prosperous from the standpoint of economic development than our current conditions the schizophrenic or manic-depressive process of speculative bubbles, great exuberance, the supposed introduction of technologies that otherwise would not have been introduced, and then financial crisis and economic recession. And let it not be said that fiduciary inflation serves at least to employ idle resources, because that is the other contemptible Keynesian argument. Citizens are deceived, and their income is reduced overnight with inflation, depreciation, and devaluation, so that by lowering real wages, the resources allocated in error can be more easily absorbed. That is a desire to go on partying, to go on taking the drug, to go on creating the illusion, and to go on treating citizens like small, irresponsible children who cannot be told the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, transparency is essential, as is a rigid monetary system that clearly exposes what is happening. In this sense, differences aside, we can consider it a blessing from God that, for instance, with respect to Greece, the European Union exists, because for the first time the Greeks have been confronted with the problems of demagogy, a welfare state, etc., which both political parties have sold them with policies like those pursued in Argentina by General Perón in the 1950s. And, differences aside, the same is true for our country, Spain. Not that I'm a particular fan of the euro, but fortunately for Spain, it represents an approach, even if only a timid one, toward the ideal of the least controlled single currency. In any case, for the first time, the euro has eliminated the possibility of Spain's having monetary policy autonomy. As a result, Spain and its politicians, economic agents, unions, Entrepreneurs and economists have had to face the fact that the country cannot avoid the structural reforms necessary to put it back on track towards sustained growth.